have something, you have to also share it to others. I want us today to encourage people that we have hope. Hope is not lost. Can I have a witness in the house? Hope is not lost. We have bright hope for the future. Hallelujah. as we say.
perfect peace, perfect love, and perfect hope. And I pray that the three dimensions of the perfect thing the Lord has brought to our life shall be so in your life in Jesus' name. Amen. I say it shall be so in the name of Jesus. Amen. Perfect peace shall occupy you and fill you to the brim in the name of Jesus. Perfect peace shall visit your home and dwell with your family in the name of Jesus. Perfect peace shall come to your business, to your career, to your academics, and whatever you lay hand upon to do in the name of Jesus. So also hope, so also love will overflow us. Thank you, Father. Shall we arise on our feet? In spite of the situation in the country, we can rejoice in the Lord. Thank God for the way our brother added to the letter this morning, that prayer session. No matter what's happening in the country, our God is in charge. Our God is in charge. And from the lesson we learned this morning, when there was a crowd of well over 10,000, because we said they counted the people that ate 5,000 men without counting children and women, most likely we have more than 10,000 in that audience. And with five loaves of bread, two pieces of fish, they were fed to overflow. You shall be fed to overflow in the name of Jesus. I can't hear you amen to that. I said, the Lord shall feed you to overflow. The Lord shall feed your family to overflow. In the name of Jesus. In spite of the situation in the country, I can see everything. Turn around. Shall we sing? Turn around. Turn around. I can see everything. Can you see it at all? Come on, come on. Come around. I can see everything turn around. Come on, sing. Turn around. Turn around. I can see everything turn around. Turn around. Turn around. Oh my God. Amen. What ought to sing that song with demonstration? Don't look gloom. Don't look morose. Look joyful. We're going to sing that song. And as you are singing it, meaning from your heart, that in spite of the situation in the country, everything is turning around for your good. In your direction, is for your good. I say, for your family, it's for your good. In your business, it's for your good. Can you see it? I swear I'm seeing it. I want to see it with the eyes of faith, like even Andrew saw multiplication, ability of the Lord to feed over 10,000 people with five loaves of bread and two pieces of fish. You are going to demonstrate where you are. I can see everything. I can see everything. Turn around. Turn around. Turn around. Turn around. I can see everything. Turn around. And we are saying it from our heart, from the bottom of our heart, by faith, that no matter what is happening in Nigeria and its economy and environment, everything shall surely turn around for our good in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. The Bible says, all things work together for good, for them that love the Lord. And because we love you, you are with us, we believe, we are certain and we declare that everything shall work for our good. For as many people are saying amen this morning, no matter the situation around their family, their home, their businesses, they left their home coming to the church this morning, hoping to receive from you. As I speak today, may everything turn around for your good in the name of Jesus Christ. May this week bring you blessing. Bless you untold. Bless you cannot imagine. A turn around you have never expected. This week you receive a call. A call to higher level of operation. A call that will gladden your heart. A call from the superior bosses. 
a, a call from the throne of heaven that we can say only God can do it. Only God can do it. I can see that happening to somebody this week. I can see that happening to somebody this week. Last so you have been expecting a response to an application. You have not received for a long time. This week, the report, the result, the response shall come in the name of Jesus Christ. That requires you are put before your boss, before iron authority, and they be looking at it without any saying. This week they shall respond. This week there shall be a response in the name of Jesus. It is done. Father, as we go into your world this morning, teach us. Give us understanding. Jesus' mighty name we pray. Shout it on us. Hallelujah. Let's have a seat. Thank you very much. Um, I have the privilege this morning to take the teaching. I thank our resident pastor, Pastor Affair, for giving me the privilege. Thank you very much. Praise the Lord. We are chapter 3 of our um, conversion lecture book. Peace. How many of you have the copy? How many of you have a copy here? Let me see. Raise it up. What happened? A copy of this. Wow. How many of you are in the conveyor this year? You were in the conveyor. Let me see your hand. You were there. Right? Wave your hand. Ah. I can't imagine members of um, Ashi not coming to the convention. Amen. And we have many senior ministers of the central office here. What do you want us to say about us? About us, because we are together. What do, we to, what do you want me to say about us? I was attending to the ESCO meeting yesterday, and um, they were asking me, don't you have a church? I said, I'm not in charge. They basically, you, you worship there? I said, yes. And they were asking some questions. What do you want me to say about us? This is my own church as well. <laughs> Praise the Lord. I want to beg our resident pastor, please get copies of this, and let members buy and get a copy. Please, even when you are not in that conversion, you can still read and be blessed. Please and please. It's not, it doesn't cost much. How much? Was it 500? I think 500 naira. That's not too much. Please, get a copy. Tell your neighbor, get a copy. Come on, you are not saying to somebody, get, get a copy. Even if you are in primary school, you spend more than that a day. We are on chapter 3 of this conversion lecture, Peace. And chapter 3 says, Becoming a peacemaker, reconciling people to God. Becoming a peacemaker, reconciling people to God. Let me start by saying that um, you cannot be a peacemaker unless you're a person of peace. I say it once again you cannot be a peacemaker unless you're a person of peace. You're a man or a woman of peace, a boy or girl of peace. You see two people, you know, in the physical world, maybe having current argument, and want to broker peace, want to come in and say, no, you shouldn't go this way. But you yourself, you are like one of them. Then when you have argument, when they beg you, don't listen. How do you want to beg somebody who will listen to you? You are like one of them. That when you are fighting, it's to fight to finish. No, it may not be physical fighting, maybe current, and they tell you this word, the Bible says, no, no, don't bring the Bible to this. He has insulted me so much. What insult has he given you? How much has he insulted you that Jesus has not passed through before? Hello? Before you can be a peacemaker, you must be what? A man or a person of peace. Are you a, can you be a peacemaker? Explain your life, the life you live. Amen. You are not a peace with your husband. You want to go and bring peace to another home. You can't do that. You cannot do successfully. Because you'll be able to say, this is what is happening in my family. This and this has been happening, and this is how much I'll be able to tolerate it, accommodate it, and we are living at peace. You can't be a peacemaker to another family. When you are not at peace with your wife, you are not at peace with your husband. You can't be. Amen. You are in the choir, you sing very well. But when you come to choir practice and meeting, don't you have quarrel that your, your coordinator will say, it's okay, say, no, okay, I'm not going to take it. Are you a lady of peace or a woman of peace? No, no, God, I'm not going to take it. She has insulted me. I've heard this word in some among the choir, some places. I don't know why it's going this way. Don't be a peacemaker. Don't 
Nobody can kill your light or your fire. Amen. Praise the Lord. Do you know we have, we have some ministers that we also are giving recurrence for ministers' meeting? Say, I brought it. Are you not a man of God? Say, no, I'm not going to take it. Are you a man of God? If you are not a man of peace, you are not a man of God. A man of peace is a man of God. That's it. So becoming a peacemaker, reconciling people to God. Open to page 37 for those of have it. And let's read together. Page 37 of the book or the pamphlet. We're going to read together the Bible quotation, which is 2 Corinthians 5, 18 to 20. Shall we go together? One, two. Now, all things of God, who has reconciled all to himself through Jesus Christ, and has given us the ministry of reconciliation, that, that is, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not in putting their response or trespass to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as true as though God were pleading through us, we implore you, hallelujah, on behalf, on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Be reconciled to God. Wow. You are giving a minister of reconciliation. And you yourself, you are not yet reconciled to God. In this passage, the word reconciled, reconciliation, um, around the word reconciled is mentioned five times. One is that fact that we have reconciled to God. The other is that we have been given the ministry of reconciliation. The other is that God is in Christ reconciling us to himself. And that um, at the same time, he has given us the ministry of reconciliation. And that, um, yeah, he has given us the word of reconciliation. And by fire, we should be reconciled to God. How do you look at it? God, through Christ, and reconcile all to himself. And here we are asked to get reconciled. It means reconciliation is not a, it's not a construct. It's an ongoing thing. Praise the Lord. On daily basis, we get reconciled with God. We are about to find ourselves not living the way God wants us to live. We are just, we are meant and keep moving on. We keep on moving on every day. And I pray as we do this, the Lord will us in Jesus' name. Um, we see here, the fact that we have been given, we have been reconciled to God by himself. And the consolation here implies receiving the, the grace of salvation through Christ Jesus. Amen. We have experienced salvation. We have experienced new birth. It is then you can say you are reconciled to God. If you have not experienced new birth, which Jesus came to the world to do, then you are yet to be reconciled to God. So, our reconciliation has to do with the new birth, the new experience we have when we surrender our life to Christ. Before you used to be a street fighter, an abuser, um, a thief, doing all kinds of things, bringing disquieted to your environment. But when you are reconciled to Christ, you become a person of peace. Your life begins to demonstrate a different kind of lifestyle. You become a son of God, a child of God. Amen. When you are reconciled to God, become what? Sons and daughters of God. In other words, the resemblance of God is inputted in us. Are you a child of God? Are you a son of God? Are you a daughter of God? Where is the evidence that God is in you? Do you resemble God? You know, I know Maybe your father has a style of living. He's the son of his father. Can you say you are the son of God? Can anybody say you are a daughter of God? Because they can see God attribute in you. Praise the Lord. I pray as we continue this teaching, the Holy Spirit will help us to imbibe the Spirit of God through Christ Jesus in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. When you forgive, do you forget? The Bible says in this passage we have just read, not in putting their trespasses to them. That where I am, you may be, I will come and take you. And that man will say, he said, what kind of thing is that? How can you have mansion inside high house? He's looking at it from the eye of man. A mansion inside the house. That's wrong interpretation. Praise the Lord. And so somebody was, he was saying that there's no home in heaven. When we talk about heaven at last, so there's no heaven at last anywhere. This is where we have. Then why are we in Christ? Why are we in the church? If there's no home in heaven, 
If there's no rapture of the saints, if not coming for us, why am I wasting my time here? Why we don't stay in the world and eat and die and perish just with the world? You will not pray with the world in the name of Jesus. Let's live the life that people can see that we really believe that there's a heaven and Jesus is coming back again and we belong to him. Hallelujah. Fully reconciled to God. Fully reconciled. I've seen a, a, a picture, you know, said, look, First Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 18 says, Comfort one another with this word. Amen. And from verse 13, it says that we that are alive will not prevent them that are, have slept. But in a, in a trumpet will sound. With the, the archangel will come and sound the trumpet, and we that are alive shall be cut off. And the Bible says, Comfort one another with this saying. And the preacher said, The coming of the Lord Jesus is just a word of comfort. See the interpretation. The Lord said, comfort yourself with what? With this, that I'm coming back to take you. Your suffering is, for, is temporary. It's for a moment. I will come back again to take you to where I am. He said, it's just a word of comfort. Jesus is not coming to anywhere. What is your faith? And you listen to those things on, on um, television, on internet, you know, social media, as much as, as very, very good advantages. There are more disadvantages on it for young believers today. There are people coming to the church, they do something else. Something terrible. Something you cannot imagine. May God have mercy upon us in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. What am I saying? That we need to understand that our reconciliation to God makes us a new being altogether. And until you are fully reconciled to God, you cannot reconcile to others. Do you believe that Jesus is coming back again? If, if you don't believe it, then you are not yet reconciled. You are just coming to church for coming's sake. You reconcile with him, you drop your old life and you begin to live a new life. That's the life you have been called to live. And until you begin to live the new life, you can't call others to the life you don't have. You can't call others to the life you don't have. The best way of preaching the gospel is to share your experience of salvation. Oh, before I was a drunkard, before I was a street fighter, because I was an adulterer and adulteress, before. I was a womanizer before I was a thief before. In, in fact, I, I can keep my list for three years and I would not greet that person. But when I came to the Lord, he took them away from my life. Now I'm a child of God. The best message that can convince your brother or sister is your life and your experience with Christ. Are you fully reconciled to God? So we are given this means of reconciliation, bringing order to Christ when we have known him. And why do we do this? Because we know the terror of God that judgment is coming upon this world. There's another preacher who said, I don't preach about hell, I don't preach about heaven. I preach about this world that I've seen. And he's a preacher. And the father of a church. I don't talk about hell, I don't talk about heaven. And Jesus mentioned hell so many times. He talks about heaven, about hell so many times. If you look at Mark chapter 9 from verse 43, he says, if it is your, uh, your leg, that will make you to go to hell. Cut it off. But it's better for you not to have leg. Uh, that to have two legs go to hell. We are the fire never quenched and the, and, the, and the maggot or what? The, uh, the, um, the insect. The worm never die. Same with your hand that will make you to go to hell. Cut it off. Jesus spoke about hell. It's better for you not to have a hand and go to heaven. He's talking about heaven. Same with it's your eye that will make you to go to hell. Remove it. Pluck it out. So Jesus believed I mean, he not only believed, he knew it. He knew that was hell. He knew that was heaven. And he preached about it. So when you get a prayer, say, I don't talk about hell. I don't talk about heaven. I want to give you 30 keys to break through on earth. How to break it through on earth and you're not breaking through in heaven. You have broken nothing at all. Hello? 30 keys to break it through with, in your business, in yourself, and then there's no breakthrough in salvation, breakthrough to heaven. You are not broken through at all. You have not broken through at all. So the break breakthrough is breakthrough to heaven. But you have it in the name of Jesus Christ. Come on, I say, but you have it in the name of Jesus Christ. So, because we know the terror of God and the judgment coming upon this world, we talk and we reconcile others to God. Just like it happened in the days of Noah. Number two, why do we reconcile people? Because of death. Hallelujah. Because of what? Death. Is given to man who wants to die after this judgment shall come. Because, and when we talk about death, oh dear, I don't need to talk to this one. He's still young, he can't die now. Who told you he can't die now? 
maybe younger than that person has died before. Amen. That we are alive today is God's a great privilege that we are alive in Christ and life in the world. Physically and spiritually, it is God's grace and favor. Because of death that may come upon anyone at any time, we have everything to talk to our neighbors about God, to reconcile them to God through Christ Jesus. Don't keep on postponing your opportunity to reconcile someone. Maybe your place of work. See, one day, one day, one that will preach to this brother. One day, one that will, you have been seeing him living in sin, living the light that can take you to hell and destroy him suddenly. See, one day, one day. You keep on postponing this. One day, one day. One year you have been together, you have not preached to that person. And the Lord will be speaking to you. Preach to him. Talk to him about Christ Jesus. Why are you postponing this? Some people are dying anyhow. People are dying mysteriously. If that person dies suddenly, you say, ah, I wish I preached. Let me tell you, because you have the inspiration to preach, to talk to that person, and you feel the blood is on your neck. The blood is on your neck. Apostle say, I, I, I'm clean from the blood of all of you because of what I preach the gospel. So when you have the opportunity to preach and you refuse to preach, if that person dies suddenly, the blood is on your neck. You have members of your family who are not yet reconciled to God and say, one day when I'm strong, where, where will you be strong? Christ is in you, the hope of glory. Come on, shout hallelujah. Don't wait to become big sin before you preach the gospel. You're already big with Christ inside you. So death is knocking and can take anybody away. And this is why we must preach the gospel. What's our obligation? Um, on page 40, and he died for all that those who live should live no longer for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. Amen. Christ died for all. But only those of us that have accepted the death of Christ Jesus can live for our life for him. He died for all. For how many people? He died for all. For how many people? For all. He died for He died for the sin of the entire world. But the entire world cannot be saved unless they come to him. Unless they accept his death and um, the atonement he has made on their behalf. They can't have it. So he died for all, that we should not live unto ourselves. So the world supposed not to live to themselves, but the world is living to themselves today. And so we have given the assignment to go and reconcile them to God, because Christ has died for them. Christ died for those we are most reconciled to God. Who are they? Number one, the sinners. The sinners. More often than now, when we talk, we say, we are all sinners. We are all sinners. We are all sinners should be in quote. Underline and italicize. And don't take, don't take it in, in the literary way. Amen. When we say we are all sinners, doesn't mean that now that you are born again, you are still remain a sinner. If you are still looking at yourself and say we are all sinners, and then you commit your sin. You continue your sin. Then you are not going to anywhere. What the Bible says, we are fellow citizens with the saints. Once you give your life to Christ and you are born again, you are a saint of the Lord. Tell your neighbor, you are a saint of the Lord. Okay, say to yourself, I'm a saint of the Lord. Do you believe in yourself? Yes, we are saints of the Lord. Amen. When we say we are all sinners, we don't meet in the way of practices in every day. All we are saying that it is the grace of God that actually saved us. That doesn't mean we live our life like the sinners outside. There are sinners outside. The Bible says if, um, if you love those who love you, what difference is between you and the sinners? Because sinners do so. Sinners, which means you are not a sinner. He said, if you give to those people that you can give you back. Jesus said, what difference between you and the sinner? Because sinners also give to those people that can get back. Which means you are not a sinner. We have been saved from sin. We are supposed to live the life of the saints. May the grace of the Lord rest on us to live the life of the saints in the name of Jesus. May God give you the grace to live the life of a saint of God in the name of Jesus Christ. So, we have been sent to reconcile the sinners. Those that are still living in sin. Because they have not known the Lord. The opening verse here says, He who believes in the Son has everlasting life. And he who does not believe the Son shall not see life. But the wrath of God abides on him. As many as are not giving their life to Christ Jesus, they are living under the wrath of God. No matter how worthy, how influential they are. No matter their position. They are under what? The wrath of God. He said, because we know the terror of God, we persuade men. The other, the wrath of God. That your brother, that your uncle. You have been running after to beg for money. All you have begged for is money and assistance. And it's not a child of God. 
You have never been bold enough to say, Uncle, I want to share something with you. I say, what? Don't be afraid. What if I say it now, it doesn't give me money again. Is it the money you want or you want his soul to be reconciled to Christ? Amen. Amen. That your uncle, that your aunt is so worthy, is so pleasure. The Bible says, as long as not reconciled to God, the wrath of God is upon him. is condemned already because they don't know God. So don't be afraid. Don't be intimidated. Don't because of the thing you want to gain this world, close your mouth to minister to members of your family. Talk to them. You have something like that and the Holy Ghost remind you as I'm talking now, pray for the courage. So that after this teaching, when you had the opportunity, open your mouth and say, Uncle, I want to share something with you. Uncle, do you know that? Hey, some, I used to live one life before. Say, hey, what's it? Let me just tell you. I was doing this. Even maybe you have lived with him before. That I was living with you. Do you know how you used to steal your money safe? Hey, it was bad though. I was so terrible. But, Uncle, do you know something? Something happened to me. I just had the gospel. And it changed my life. And all those things just vanished. And I come to realize that Jesus is coming back again. And I come to realize that without believing in Christ, this world is a useless place. It's vanity upon vanity. Uncle, how about that? Can you also commit your life to Christ? Let him slap you. It's good. You witness the word. Let him slap you. See what I need to Let him slap you. Take away the slap. Say, hey, Uncle, I don't care if you slap me. But Jesus is what? Jesus is real. Come and shout hallelujah. They slapped Jesus. They beat him. And that did not stop him. What am I saying? We must take it up as on ourselves to preach the gospel to the sinners, especially members of our household. Members of our household. Amen. Hallelujah. It says, sinners are those who have never been born again. They may or may not have heard about the gospel of Jesus Christ. Some of them are moral, uh, moralists. They genuinely and sincerely do what is considered good in the eyes of man. They give to the poor. They help them. They help when help is needed. But they are still sinners. Isn't there are sinners in the church as well? There are sinners in the church. Are you not surprised? Maybe you are one of them. You are in the church, but you are living the life of a sinful person. You must be reconciled to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So they must have heard the gospel many times, but they have not yet believed. They have not reconciled. They have not changed. You can't see evidence of change. You still need to preach to them. Oh, that man, we are in the same work. He is a church. He, he, he attends. Don't let me mention his church. Maybe a Pentecostal church by name. That's where he attends. But his life does not show that he has given his life to Christ. Don't be ashamed or be intimidated to preach Christ to him. He said, oh, don't you know, what are you talking about? I'm a choir in the church. I tell the social church, he says, sir, but I've not seen evidence that you are really born again, sir. It's, it's more than church. It's about Christ in our life. Hallelujah. So, you have to talk to the sinners wherever you find them. Like, um, I was talking during the mission night in the convention when I was preaching, I spoke about the fact that the mission work is to everyone that has not yet been converted. Even if he goes to church, you still have an assignment to reach that person. Shout hallelujah. So the sinners, number two, are the backsliders. There are people in the church that are backslided. The worst thing is that we have backsliders who are pretending to still be believers. You can't easily identify them. Unless you move close to them, you see their lifestyle. So when you see people that are backslided from the Christ, from Christ, from the church, from God, don't condemn them. Find time to still move closer and help them back to Christ. Hallelujah. Even in the Bible, we have demons who went to the world and then, of course, Peter or John, or rather, Apostle Paul was able to bring it back to the gospel again. Even we have the issue of them, um, about demons, we have Mark. He also went off after the first missionary journey. And Paul com actually complained about him bitterly, but became a useful Israel later in the world. So when you see people that are backslidden, don't write them off. Find time to make closer and help them back to Christ. And I pray you will not become a backslider in Jesus' name. Now move on to page 42. Becoming a peacemaker at home and in the family. We're going to work on this house place. You have to be a peacemaker in your home and your family. So if there's no peace in your home, how do you broker peace in other homes, in other family? 
how to become a peacemaker in the family. Number one, pursue peace. Tell your neighbor, pursue peace. So let that be peace in your home. Let that be understanding in your family. Between husband and wife, let that be peace. So husband and wife, they sleep together on the same bed, but there's no peace in their home. They're not living in peace. The husband will back, will face one direction, the wife will face one direction. Amen. If the husband feel like, ah, ah, let me touch this one, push your hand, and push away the hand again. Amen. So, how do you live your life as a man of life if that's the way you live? Just because your husband offended you in the afternoon, you feel that in the evening or the night, that's the time to punish him. No, that's not way to be a peacemaker. You are not happy the matter, you are worsening it. Amen. Don't deny your husband, don't deny your wife. Be at peace with each other. Pursue peace with your husband, pursue peace with your husband, pursue peace with your wife. And that is how peace can reign in your home. You know that something that you, when you do it, your wife be angry. So I don't care. Let her be angry today. Girl. You go ahead, deliberate to do it. You are not a peacemaker. You are a troublemaker. You are doing something deliberate. That you, I know my wife says, he's going to be angry. He's going to talk. He's going to, he's going to talk. You are talking within yourself. You communicate with yourself. I know she's going to hash out now. I may say, ah, um, honey, uh, I don't know what he calls you. Honey or sugar or titi or whatever. I say, ah, why have you done this? I say, I know you talk. Because you knew you would talk. That's why you have done it. It's the wrong thing. You know, there's a thing you do that make your husband to become angry and you continue to do it. No. Be a peacemaker. Broker peace with your husband and wife. Let peace start with our home. If there's no peace in your home, you are not going to get peace anywhere. And let the peace start between husband and wife. And how would this happen? Number two says, love your wife. Love your wife. That's what the Bible recommends. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25. It says men should love their wife out. The way Christ loved the church and gave himself to her. Gave himself for her. The way Christ loved the church and gave his life for the church. That's the extent men should love their wives. And unless you have that kind of love, peace will not be the kind of peace the Lord wants to have in your home. You want true peace? Where your wife respects you? Where your dog can do anything because of you? Then love her. Show her that love like that of Christ. Amen. Peace in your home. Men in the house. You are married. Can you see? Stand up. You are married. Men in the house. You are married. You have a wife. Rise up. Rise up. If you are a married man, please, please. Hello. If that person is sleeping, wake him up. Maybe he doesn't know you have a wife. Remind him that you have a wife. I'll be seeing you with a woman. Remind him. Look around. If there's no man standing, and you know that you have be seeing a woman with him. Remind, remind you have a wife. Amen. The Bible says you should love your wife. How? The way Christ loved his wife and gave his life. Men that are standing. How many of you can die for your wife? How many of you that are standing? You can die for your wife. That is, ah, something is threatening this family. Hey, the only way to allow this family to survive and my wife to live is for me to die. Or maybe I'm Robert come and say, yes, should be this of you. Man or woman, who want to go? Say, ah. Madam, were you ready to go? <laughs> Amen. How many of you be ready to die for your wife? If you, are, if you, are, you can do it, sit down. If you cannot do it, I will, now I will preach my gospel to you. You can die for your wife, sit down. You cannot die for your wife, stand up, keep on standing. Let's let it consign. Aha. Aha. Ojoku. Sister Mudukwe. Hey, work for Ben. You didn't do that direction. <laughs> yes, you are saying something. You say what? Come, come and say it to the speaker. Let them hear you. So, uh, let me, uh, no, come and say it. Yeah, I'm, I, I, the new gospel is going on in the road. Now. Yeah. What I'm saying is that I survive for her, but I don't die for her. I choose to say. Come, come, bro. The Bible says, you should love your wife the way the, the way Christ loved the church yes. and died for her. So that the church might live and survive. Now, as you in a threatening situation, we are two of you, either of you must go. We are you ready to die so that your wife can live on? We we survive together. <laughs> ah. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Now we can pray that we should survive together. But the reality of genuine love is that the man must be ready to die for the wife. That is the standard of the Bible. 
That's the standard of the Bible. That's the standard of the Bible. Amen. We can always pray that we survive together. But what if we come to a point that one must go for the one to leave? Who goes? I've taught a lesson like Jesus. Someone say, well, I would prefer my wife to prefer his wife to that because the man is the breadwinner. Who told you the man is the breadwinner? Christ is the breadwinner for the family. Hallelujah. So let's, let's ab- agree with the Bible. I'm glad ready to pray. It's just like the new doctrine now. We have to say, for, for better, for worse. No, some churches have changed to what? For better, for better. I know men that are married. Do you have for better, for better in the world? Is there anything for better, for better in the world? It doesn't happen. Life is both, you see, good and bad. God in good times is the God in bad times. God on the mountain is the God in family. And that's the life we live in. In fact, you just say you, in the world you have tribulation. It doesn't say smooth. Everything will not be smooth. Amen. So, but we have the modern trend that in marriage is for, but better for better, you are deceiving yourself. It's for better for worse. Amen. They say in health and sickness. They change you to say in health and health. No sickness. Who told you you will not be sick? Ah. No, it doesn't happen. So, we must abide by the word of God. The truth. The truth of the word of God will allow to dwell in us. So that we don't allow strange doctrine to swear us. When we are not rooted in the world, you don't believe the word as it is. Take the word of God raw. The word of God is what? Raw. Take it as it is. And let the Holy Spirit help you to abide with it. Praise the Lord. Men in the house, Bible says, love your wife to the extent that you can die even for your wife. Amen. And when you do this, let me tell you, there's nothing your wife cannot do. Some of us, we have family problems with our wife because we have not demonstrated love enough. You can demonstrate love to the extent that your wife will surrender everything. Yes or no? That's why it's yes. Amen. Don't the convert teaching the man who taught this place say that women are like incubator. You give them anything, they multiply it and also magnify it. Give them love. They give love back to you. Uh, they already love. A woman loves you to drop his father's name, leave his father's house and come and dwell with you. It's a great love. It's a great submission. And for men... How can we get beasts in the home? Number three says, submit. Um, I mean, the woman should submit to your husband. Woman, submit to your husband. That's a story told us in the conversion. I've soon ran off. I can't go too far. In the conversion of a woman, that the husband was not treating her with love. This show love. This show no. I, I, I can't say a couple to be. Just this last Sunday, they be in courtship. I say, what has this man given to you? Say, I've given so and so and so. I've had a courtship, people have a courtship for one year. I say, No, I don't want to bribe their with gift, and so I've never given anything. Love is demonstrated in giving. Love is demonstrated what? In giving. For God so loved the world that gave. If he didn't give, how do you know God loved the world? He gave his only begotten son. You can't be a courtship with a woman and say, Because he doesn't want to, you don't want to. Want to have to feel that you are bribing now, you can't buy even a little and something and say, Lord, I just find this, I want to give it to you. Give, show her that, that you love that woman. Amen. So we learned that that woman was fed up with the husband and went to the husband to die because without death, he cannot be free. As she went to the, to the mother and said, I'm, I've tired enough, I've suffered enough. Maybe to the mother or to somebody, anyway, I've suffered enough, I want the husband to die. I said, what, for what you say? He doesn't show love, doesn't show care, blah, blah. I said a lot of him. So, okay, I'm going to give him a message. But he said, please, I don't want him to die suddenly so that he will not know I'm the one. Give me so, a person that when I give him his food, he'll be done little by little, gradually, gradually. It might take like six months before he passed away. And the message case, that's all right. Go and prepare it. I went and prepared something I gave to the woman. The woman said, during this time, you know, you are giving poison to your husband that he might die. So, you must show love, show respect. When you wake up in the morning, how are you? How are you doing? My house, what do you want to eat? Go and give him food. Give everything possible. Take care of him so that he will not suspect you. That you are the one killing him. And the one was very happy. I said, ah, no problem. I know very soon. After six months, he will go. Then he started giving the person, put it in his food, little by little. And every morning, he will get her and knead her and greet her and greet the husband. And then before he comes back, he will wash something, prepare his food. What do so marvelous this thing? And the husband was surprised. Ah! Why is he changing this woman? She has changed. See her, the way she treats me with love, with so much care. And then the man went out and would buy very precious things and said, Darling, this is for you. Say, ah, you want to surprise? I've never bought anything for me before. Why buy? The time is about to die. Is that he buy something? 
Then maybe probably used to give a little amount of money. He will not give a surplus amount of money. No something to buy for herself, for the family. And then the man started showing a lot of giving and sacrifice because he was impressed by the wife's submissiveness and care. And got to a level that the wife now went to the man and said, please, I don't want the husband to die again. Say why? The way he's caring for me, the supply, the way he stands for me, I can't withstand seeing him die. He must not die. Ah. The man said, it's too late. He has a few months. He said, yo, you must do everything possible. He must not die. He must not die. Then he wants to say, well, he will not die. What I gave you was not a poison. It was just ordinary flour. So, the reason I told you to be submissive to your husband and do well is to see the change in him. Now you have seen it. You don't want him to die. What you have been doing for the past few months that made your husband to begin to buy and cherish and worship you, keep doing it. Keep doing it. Tell the woman by yourself, keep doing it. Keep doing it. Amen. There's no man, the woman will so submission and care that the husband will not respond. That's the truth of it. Praise the Lord. So what are we saying this morning? There can be peace in your home. When the husband loved the wife the way Christ loved the church. When the wife also submit to the husband, you see a change. Let no man say, I want to wait until my wife submit before I love. Is this wrong? Hello? Don't say, the Bible says the wife should submit to the husband. I want to wait until she submit to me before I show love. That is wrong. Did we submit to Christ before he showed love? He first showed love. It was his love towards us that made us to submit. If somebody can do this, ah, I'm ready to do anything for him. So, wife, submit to your husband. Don't wait until uh, maybe he shows you love before you submit. And also, also, husband, love your wife. Don't wait until she submits. Do it naturally that your love to her might bring you submission. Praise the Lord. And then the number three thing that can bring peace to the home is forgive. You learn to forgive. Forgive one another. Forgive one another. I'm going to mention one more and then we shall close. Forgive one another. Amen. I'm not going to say much. I want to go a demonstration here. What is the sin? Men in the house. Married men again. What is the sin that your wife can commit that will not forgive her? We have one. Can you raise your hand? You don't need to stand. What is the sin that your wife will for, will can commit you will not forgive her? Let me see. Are you sure? You can forgive us all the sins of your wife? Amen. Hallelujah. But there are some who say, well, if she commits fornication, then I send her away. We can't live together again. Now, men in the house, if your wife commits fornication, God forbid. Say God forbid. Men, say God forbid. Now, if your wife falls into the sin of fornication and you are aware, what will you do? How many of you will still allow her to remain in your house? Are you sure? Amen. So we call the Bible. The Bible says you cannot divorce your wife except for adultery. And since she has committed adultery, she, she should go. But Jesus told them, he said it was not so in the beginning. He said Moses permitted them. Because of what? Because of their stiff nakedness. He allowed them to divorce their wife because of what? They are stiff naked. So if you are a man, you want to divorce your wife because he has committed, I don't pray it happen. What if it happens? If you want to divorce your wife because he has done this thing, it means you are stiff naked. You are stiff naked. There is no sin your wife can commit that she's not able to forgive. Women in the house. Hey, look, can I see your hand? Women, married women. Is there anything your husband will commit you cannot forgive? None. I pray it should be so in Jesus' name. There was a, a young lady who was married. They have a housemate. The husband used to be a Christian. If you go to church together, but the husband was not completely, genuinely combated. They have a housemate. I know the husband was messing up around with housemate and others. He said, hmm, the day I come back to this house and I see this man on my housemate, hmm, I will use knife and kill the two of them. The man and the woman, they will go together that day. They asked her, when you kill your husband and kill the housemate, what has become of you? What is your gain? Number one, you become a widower. Sorry, a widow, isn't it? Immediately your, your name changed to what? A widow. Number two, you become a murderer. 
and you cannot survive either of these two. So there's no sin. Your husband can sin or commit and cannot forgive. We are all human beings. We are subject to error. But with the spirit of Christ in us, we can overcome our sins and challenges. There's no sin you cannot forgive. Psalm 103 verse 1, 2, 3 says, Bless the Lord, my soul, and forget not what? All his benefits. Who forgiveth what? All thy iniquities. How many of the iniquities did God forgive? All thy iniquities. And he let all thy disease. Let's remember that we should be ready to forgive. No amount of sin is too big to forgive between husband and wife. And finally, the last word there before I close today. He say, help, help each other. If you want your family to be at peace, help each other. Husband, don't say, well, I'm the Lord of the house. My wife must do everything. Don't be like that. Help each other. Financially, help each other. Maybe you are the wife, you have upper hand, you have enough money, and your husband, you know, you must bring money for this. Do you help? Be part of the financials of the house. Amen. Then men now work in the house, help one another. I was in the U.S. some, maybe some seven years ago. I met a family in Texas. They were fighting and quarreling and on and on. And I wanted to find out what is the essence of this quarrel. The wife used to be a daughter of a daughter in the Lord to me. And I said, okay, I want to visit the family. I left where I was. I went to their house. We do that. We just spent a few hours and said to. But when I got there, it was very terrible. And I had to phone back and... Um, and I told my host that, please, I'm not coming back home today. I'm sleeping with this family. We talk and talk. And I find out that the reason why they were having quarrel was that the husband um, came to Nigeria to marry. And expected that the woman should be like a slave in the house. He said, I went to Nigeria to marry this woman. We know that when she get to America, she'll behave very well, cook my food, wash my clothes, do everything. Do you know that she'll become an American woman? She was just, she, she, she's, she's talking back to me. And I asked the woman, why are you behaving? They say, no. I don't, a pastor came to our church and told us that, look, in America, the woman is at the top. And there's no reason why the husband should ride you. I know. It's also, we have, have my role. She should have, have, she's playing her role. I'm not a slave. I'm not going to be a slave to her or to him. And so I've listened to that seminar and I know that I have to take my position and also exert my right. So I find that the woman was exerting right as an American woman. And the husband was exerting right as African man. The African man will say, I'm the owner of the house. If you misbehave, I will send you out to your father's house. And the woman in America will say, look, if you mess, mess up or in any part of Europe, I will send you out to. And of course. <laughs> if you mess around, it will send you away. Because the man will call the police, hello, my husband is about to kill me. The police will run down with the ambulance. They won't ask your, the husband any question. They just package the husband. Package. He <laughs> will they were allowed to take anything out of the house. They package the husband and take him out. And some place they give me a rule that 200 meter radius don't come near this house. Then they plant a CCTV. If you go around that house, between 200 meters, the man is in trouble. Over there, the woman owns the house. And the man will be sent out. But in, in Africa, the man is the owner, is the landlord, is the almighty man in the house. If we can send away the woman. And the man will hold, be, be own the children. But in the Western world, the woman owned the children. She will retain the children and be owned the house. And I said, well, this is what is destroying your home. In God's standard, the husband and the wife, they own the house together. It's not done to only one person. We own it together. That's what the Bible says. We are joint heir. We are joint heir of the kingdom. Husband and wife, we are joint heir of the kingdom. We must help one another to make heaven. Amen. Then I told her, okay, okay, I know your problem. I said, man, drop the African, African culture. Af Afro mentality, drop it now. And you two drop the uh, American mentality, drop it now. And now come together in the way of the scripture. He said, he, will come, he said, the man will come back from work, I'll be cooking, I will just sit down at the, at the television, I'll be watching television. And when the boy be say, go and meet your mother. The mother was cooking, and the two are working, go and meet your mother. Send away the, the, the young boy because he was watching television. I said, the woman said, I'll be suffering enough, is enough. So we are supposed to be sharing. Of course, I, went, I was able to end the quarrel by God's grace. Let them know that they must be God's family and not just African or American family. Go the way of the Bible. And then I was able to tell the husband, you can help your wife. Don't allow her to do everything. Your wife has not come back from you. There's nothing wrong with you cooking rice. Get it ready before she returns. There's nothing wrong with you cooking and uh, making neighbor. 
I did men we can cook rice, Abi. Men, come to me cook rice. Okay, we don't have to. Just pour water. Where the, <laughs> where the water is falling? Pour rice. Where the water is going down? Shake it. Where Test it. If it's worth, put it down. Amen. Men, we can make a bath. Where the water is boiling? Bring it down. Pour the garlic. Turn it like this. Everybody's ready. Hallelujah. Don't put everything on the woman. Let's have one another. So women, they will be the one to wash the clothes, buy everything. They will still be ironing. Ah, ah. Your wife is ironing your clothes. You are sitting down. Look at, can't you iron? Iron your clothes. Iron your wife's wife. Your clothes and your wife's uh, clothes. Iron them together. Wipe them. Put them together. You can't be too old for this. I'm approaching 70. And I do that in my house. By God's grace. I wash plates. I don't cook, eat, finish eating. I pack the plates. My wife will come back from work. I wash it before she returns. If there are pots in the kitchen, I wash those pots. Let there be peace in our home. Shall we rise up? Amen. Young people that are not yet married, learn from us. Those in your, in your time, this is old time religion. No. The Bible has not changed. The Bible has not changed. And there shall be peace in your home in Jesus' name. Let's pray for ourselves and say, Father, in any way, my attitude, my lifestyle has not allowed peace in my home. Father, change me today. Shame me today. Father, give me the spirit of reconciliation. Break me down. Grab me to powder and remove me and reshape me. Pray that prayer for yourself in the name of Jesus. Pray for yourself, Lord. Break me down. In either of my arrogance, either of my proud, either of my pride, we am too, I feel too pompous to do something. Father, help me to change today. In the name of Jesus. Pray to God. Pray to God. Lord, break me down. Shame my culture. Shame my attitude. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Help me, Father. In the name of Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Let the men begin to pray for themselves. Say, God, give me the heart of Christ. That I may love my wife to the extent that I can even die for her. I will provide her she survive. Than rather me, than rather for her to die while I still live. Pray that, pray, men. Why we are going to pray? Lord, give me the grace to submit to my husband like unto the Lord. No matter the situation. Pray that, pray in the name of Jesus. Pray, pray, pray that, praise, And ask them to help you in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Finally, do you have a, some homes or families? No, the peace is not there. The way you are living today was not how you started. Not how you started. But today, there's so much trouble. And you want divine intervention. You want divine intervention. You want the genuine peace of Christ to return to your home. The choirs sang about perfect peace. It is only the perfect peace of Christ in your home. Living according to the standard of the Bible that can make you to be at rest of mind. You can be smiling and you are suffering inside. But you want a genuine peace. You want your family to come back to what it used to be. You want real peace. Maybe you have not even known peace at all alone since you got married. You want peace to come in. Can you raise up your hand as I pray with you? Mary can stand up. Pray your hand wherever you are. I'm not going to call you forward today. Just raise up your hand. I'm going to pray with you for where you are. You know the peace you had when you newly married is no God there. You want the Lord to restore that peace. Raise your right hand as I pray with you now. Raise your right hand. Raise your right hand. Father, I pray for those hands that are raised. That your spirit rest upon their hands. In the name of Jesus. Put that hand on your chest. Father, I pray, Father, for these men and women. That that old God will give them a new heart. For the man, the heart of genuine love. To the extent of Christ's example. To the woman, the, the grace and the submission to the level of the church to Christ. And so that there will be peace in their home in the name of Jesus Christ. Don't think they have been doing before. There used to be joy and peace and the husband is no longer doing. Or the wife no longer doing. I pray Father, grace to restore them, receive in the name of Jesus Christ. Grace to restore them, receive in the name of Jesus Christ. I pray for our young brothers and sisters who are not yet married. Who are already made up their mind. Pray him. Amen. Ah! What Ah, ah, me, I don't go be any slave to any man. Ah, ah. We, we, everybody will go and buy food. <laughs> Father, I pray for our young sisters, 
young brothers. I was able to correct my daughter and do the correction that day. It was a good one. There are so many young men and women too who have the same mind. In our own age, no cuckoo, no, no, no man will ride me. I pray for young ones here who are already having a standard contrary to the Bible standard. That thou God will speak to their heart in the name of Jesus Christ. Holy Ghost, speak to their heart in the name of Jesus Christ. Many of them they are yet to get married, but the husband they are to marry, they are already made. They are human beings, they are already working. Not a baby that will be born tomorrow. Father, I pray for those men and young women who are yet to get married when they are already due. Holy Ghost, connect them in the name of Jesus Christ. Holy Ghost, connect them together in the name of Jesus Christ. Whatever is standing as barrier or barricade or intra between you and your husband to be, I command it be removed now in the name of Jesus Christ. Those of you that are already getting to stop and agitating, say, I, I, how long I have to be a bachelor and a sprinter? I pray today, the God of heaven will broke up peace in your heart and bring you to conversation with your husband or wife to marry in the name of Jesus Christ. And when it is done and you are connected, you give the glory to the Lord. Thank you, Father. I pray for our church generally, government worldwide, let peace of God restore. To every family where there are torments, there are misunderstanding, let peace restore to those homes in the name of Jesus Christ. If they are home here this morning, who have not even confessed that the notice are not okay, Father, by yourself, go to those homes and family and reconcile them in the name of Jesus Christ. For all of us, the grace to reconcile others. How can we reconcile others when we are not reconciled to God? When our life also denied the real reality of Christ. I pray, therefore, that, O oh God, will break every of us down and regrind us and remold us and shaping us in the name of Jesus Christ. That we all may be fully reconciled to God waiting for the coming of the Lord. And as we do that, waiting for the coming of the Lord, we shall go out there. We shall go out there. We shall go out there and bring new people to Christ in the name of Jesus Christ. Like Andrew did to bring Simon Peter. May we imbibe that spirit where every Sunday we have newcomers who want to know the Lord. Then we go to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Open your two hands before you. These hands that are open, Father, some of them gave money Offering, tithe, and so on and so forth. Father, bless their hand in return in the name of Jesus Christ. Bless their hand in return in the name of Jesus Christ. As we go to this week, into the new week you are entering to, the Lord will bring blessing into your hands, into your hands, into your bosom, in the name of Jesus Christ. The key you need to succeed this week, receive that key in the name of Jesus Christ. The key you need to exert this week, receive that key in the name of Jesus Christ. In spirituality, in your career, in your business, in your academic life, in whatever you find yourself, the key to excel this week and to enjoy peace of God, receive it in the name of Jesus Christ. Next Sunday, we shall come back to testify to God's goodness. Jesus' mighty name, we pray. And so, may the good Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, our fellowship of the Holy Spirit, be with us now and forevermore. And we shall seven power of hallelujah. 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 Finally, let's sound seven victory according to our father, Pastor. You have been on my father's sound it. Okay. Seven victory together. One to go. Victory. 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 God bless you. Thank you very much.